um, the podcast was going so well. So that made it easier because it made it feel like this is my time. Like, you know, the world and the universe is telling me with these like awards and recognition that this is what I was meant to do. <laughs> well, that's a good um, so sign that made, for sure. Yes. So that made it easier. But, you know, uh, anytime you're in the point of your career where I was 20 plus years, I was, you know, very senior. Um, that, you know, is like a personal decision that mm. it's, it, yes, it's about the children, but it's also about like you, I don't, it just dropped. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, no, you're all good. Yeah, it's, it's about the children and the family, but it's also like, you, you know, like, mm. do you lose your sense of identity at the same time? So all of that, but I think, you know, my children, my family, my husband, my podcast was like, they were like all these things that were like the universe is saying, Tracy, this is the time, just do it. <laughs> so, so I had a, a similar experience in the sense that, um, so my background is in fundraising for not-for-profit. So I've always worked for, um, for NGOs uh -huh. and, and not for profits, and and we uh, have yeah. so much to talk about. <laughs> we do that so another podcast. <laughs> so my last job was working actually on the corporate side, so I was doing corporate social responsibility, uh, and so my contract wasn't renewed at the end of last year, making cuts. I guess well, we, they were making cuts because of COVID. And so it was a very similar thing. So I started Seven Million Bikes in 2019. And it was just a hobby as a podcast. And then I started doing comedy just as a hobby. Then I started doing more. And then I started doing comedy shows. And so by last year, I was just doing so much. I actually, on my season three or four of the podcast, I only put out five episodes because I just didn't have time. Normally, a season is at least 10 episodes, maybe 12. And I think it was season three. I only did five episodes because I just couldn't do any more. Um, and things were starting to get busier. I was doing more and more comedy shows. I was starting to get invited to go up to Da Nang and Hoi An to do shows up there, things like this. And so I was unsure what was going to happen with my job. I kind of thought they weren't going to renew my contract. It kind of seemed that way. You know, when, when there's a lack of communication, you're like, yeah, it's probably going to not go the way that you want it to go. So similar thing, I had to make a decision. And obviously with my wife, and I was like, well, look, and we kind of already talked about it. I was like, do I go full time 7 million bikes? Like, do we take this to the next level? Do we make it a business? And so now I, it's not 7 million bikes isn't just the podcast. We, pro we provide English language entertainment through comedy shows. We do quiz nights, events, and the podcast as well. And so that was kind of, the decision was always made for us, which is one of these nice kind of universe moments that you're like, well, we were thinking of doing it. And the universe has just told me that I don't have a job now. So... <laughs> What let, let's do it. So it's now led to one of my favorite jokes. So I now have a new joke that I do on stage that because I lost my job, I decided to become a full-time comedian and a part-time teacher, which means I full-time make no money. <laughs> but you feel so good inside, right? And I feel like... No, trust me. I mean, my husband always... He always... Um, he's like my number one supporter, but he's always like, I, well, when I had a full-time job and then I was doing the podcast, I was doing this on nights and weekends. Right. Um, and he always says, gosh, I just don't know how you do it. Like all these hours that you spend on this, like, it's so impressive. Like, and you get paid nothing. And I'm like, I know, but that's not what's driving yeah, me. Yeah. It's like, it makes me feel so good. And then when I get like emails from like, the families of the people that I've shared their stories. Like I get emails from like the children that are like, you know, my dad always talked about this, but hearing you tell his story, like it was an incredible experience. Wow. And thank you so much for doing this for my family. And, you know, those things for me is like, I don't need to be rich. I feel so good <laughs> and happy and I just love what I do. And, um, and I feel like that happiness makes you a better person. It really does. Like yeah. that inner happiness of, you know, I well, don't see, know. I, I didn't Maybe work I'm in, just like I didn't a dreamer. In, <laughs> well, I, I didn't work in corporate America, so I was already pretty happy with myself. But um, <laughs> the, the, the other joke that it led to was, I haven't told this joke in a while, was that, it, you know what it's like, you know, working for yourself. So, I mean, I work more hours than I ever have in my life. I work from the moment I wake up, especially being locked up at home. I wake up, I make my coffee for me and my wife, and then I just start working. And I'm working until basically I go to bed most nights. But it doesn't feel like work because you're doing what you love and, I, and I'm just doing things. It's different to having a job where you're like, okay, I'm here from eight to five. You're like, I'm just, 
I'm just, I don't think I'm, I never think I'm at work. I'm just doing what I do. But so I made the joke early on that um, I decided to add up how much money I made per hour, <laughs> uh, like running a business. And I, fuck, I've, I've forgotten the punchline right now. But anyway, that was, I remember doing the lead up to the joke saying, so I've started to work out how much I make per hour. And someone in the front row obviously has run their own business before. And he just said loudly, he went, don't do it. Don't do that calculation. Don't work oh. out. <laughs> I know. It's funny because I try to, I, I've only recently gotten a handle of how much time it takes us per episode. Um, but <laughs> I bet you, I bet I, you regret doing that now. Well, I think it's better because I'm glad that I did because now I'm I'm smarter about our process and then it helps me think financially, you know, how much money we want to raise again because we're a nonprofit. Um, you know, these are things that I have to think about that I never thought about at the beginning because to your point, I was like, no, 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 I'm not getting distracted like it's going to it's going to lose the heart. And what I'm <laughs> what I'm trying to do if I like try to like you know put numbers around all of this, but um, I think that also it just comes naturally over time. You get more efficient, you get better at it. I think at the beginning it's all about discovery, mm -hmm. um, and so there's definitely going to be a lot more hours involved in figuring out what works and what doesn't. And I feel like having done this um, <clears throat> for three years now, we've gotten to a place where. Um, you know, I, I have a lot more clarity on what I'm trying to create in the process to get there. Yeah. Um, but we're also evolving, like, you know, our upcoming seasons, I'm looking to explore different formats and different stories. And yeah, so I course. think it's a natural progression. Yeah. Well, I've just talked to my wife just not long before we started. I think I might start another podcast about uh, comedy, but we'll, we can talk about that another time. Um Damn it, I was going to say something. I'm probably going to, this chat is amazing. I love this chat, but I'm going to actually cut this bit out and make it into a separate bonus content podcasters talking about podcasts because I do it for the Patreons. I do like bonus content. And so sure. we're veering away from the, the message of the episode, but I definitely love this chat. It's awesome. We have a lot of uh, a lot of similarities along, along the way there. I was going to say something and I forgot now. Oh, it'll come back to me. All right, I'll, I've got, so let's go, I'll go back to the questions. Now, my next question was going to be, um, what has been the best thing about lockdown for you? But I think you've already answered that in the, the things in the beginning, right? And it's been very similar here as well, um, that in the beginning, it was um, loads of fun and we were kind of like hanging out, and blah, blah, blah. And now we're kind of like, we're both in this bit of a rut where we're just get up, do it. We don't have kids. We have a dog, which is not a kid, but it still takes a little bit of work, right? But we're just in this kind of robotic thing right now but so we are looking forward to to getting out of this lockdown i just remembered what i was going to say and then it went out of my head again oh that's it i remembered now what you're saying about getting those messages from people um it's my favorite thing about the podcast and i've had messages from people around the world probably similar to you telling me as well similar not in the same context of you because yours is very specific but saying like you know uh, I listen, for, I'm Vietnamese and I'm from America and I love listening to your podcast. I love learning about it. Uh, even I have people who have messaged me saying, oh, I'm coming to Vietnam on a holiday and I, I found your podcast and it, I'm so excited to come. Or I lived in Vietnam years ago and then I listen to your podcast. It makes me so, it makes me remember so many good things. And um, talking about, you know, how it can be tough sometimes, especially during this lockdown right now, you know, it's really hard to keep motivated uh, it's like almost a struggle every day to keep motivated but I somehow managed to do it but yesterday I was having just a really shit day I just was feeling like ugh, just like not about anything in spe anything specific and then literally like five things happened like back to back where my wife was teaching an online class and she came out and I was like you know I was having a shit day you'll never believe what just happened one was like we had a brand new member on the of the community had joined up someone I'd never met before just randomly got an email that this person had joined up and then I was messaging back and forth with him. Then uh, one of them is a silly one. I'll take this one out, but I'd been chasing up an invoice I was due because I do like lots of other kind of stuff. As I said, we're an entertainment company and this guy had been avoiding this invoice, which I was getting annoyed about. And then he suddenly emailed me saying he was paying the invoice. 
Then I got another message from someone else. I can't remember. Oh, I, I, I'd emailed this comedian who'd been on my show. If you go on my YouTube channel, you'll see I'd used his comedy in a whole bunch of YouTube videos and TikTok and things like this. And I'd sent him and I said, oh, here, I put your videos up. And he was, he emailed me back and he's like, thank you so much. He's like, that really like has encouraged me. Like sometimes I find it tough with comedy. So that means a lot to me. And so, you know, I got all these like little messages of positivity and I went from like feeling pretty shitty to then like, oh yeah, I feel this, like these, this is pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, wait, so what was the question? No, sorry, I skipped back. Forget about the question. <laughs> I skipped back because I forgot what I was saying. That I'm going to edit all of this, so don't worry. But that was in relation to what you were saying about getting messages. And then I forgot what I was going to oh, say. Oh, yes. And then I remembered what I was going to say. So <laughs> we can continue talking about what I just said, but I'm going to separate this and it's going to be its own little mini content. Yeah, I mean, we, um, yeah, I love getting messages. Um, you know, it makes it, it, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like in podcasts, <clears throat> you can get lost in the numbers. Um, and it's not about numbers where we're trying to track how much time we spend with things, but like downloads, plays, you know, how many listeners do we have, which, you know, in podcasting, it's like, the stats are so opaque. <laughs> it depends on what platform you're using. Like you can get simple things like plays, um, downloads and like, you know, where it's coming from. But like to actually know who your listeners are, like that type of data who do you, is who not do you use always available. For your host? So I use Podbean, um, but like, so I have stats on Spotify, which I have certain stats mm. um, of my listeners on Spotify. Then you have certain ones on Apple, Apple and, and then stuff, so, yeah. so all of their all of the own platforms. Mm. Um, See, I don't look at any do... of those. So oh, we, okay. I, I use Buzzsprout, and Buzzsprout just mm -hmm. puts it all into one. I would totally recommend Buzzsprout, but if you're already doing Podbean, it's fine. But I only look at Buzzsprout, so it just tells you your total downloads, the countries are from, devices, all that yeah. stuff, and it's uh, so and I don't even Podbean bother looking does. at Spotify. Oh, okay. That's what Podbean does. But if you look at Spotify, they break it down by gender of what they yeah. know, age, age group. Yeah, um, that's too much like work interest. for me. I don't look at all of that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's hard not to. Um, and I think for us specifically, when we go to look for funding, these are stats mm, that are yeah, important. Sure. You know, who are we reaching? Anyways, where I was going with that is that it's so hard to get lost in yeah. all of that. And it's so hard to like, you know, when you go to ask for money, they're like, how many downloads do you have? Mm. Who are your listeners? And yeah. these are things that um, I think at first I was getting caught up in. Now, similar to you, I don't really pay attention. And mm. here's why. is because I know that our podcast is niche. I know that we're not going to reach millions of people. We might, but that's not what I'm here to do. Mm. I'm here to tell very specific stories, uh, specific experiences for the purposes of um, not only preserving the stories, but in encouraging dialogue about mm. these stories and encouraging learning and having empathy and expanding, you know, your your mindset and your knowledge of history. Like, that's what I'm here to do. So I think that for me, because I finally have come to terms with that and center around it and um, actually am very proud that then when I get the feedback from listeners, it's so much more meaningful because I think mm -hmm. it validates that, yeah, the people that I am reaching are the ones that truly do care and enjoy listening to these stories. Um, I also think the community that we've built have strong affinity to what we do. Um, I recently released um, a listener survey, just like 10 questions or less, because I wanted to know who our listeners were. And um, we had a great majority. So first of all, I had no idea that less than 50% of our listeners are of Asian descent. I would have thought that it's 90% of our oh, listeners. Interesting. So we actually have a lot of listeners that are, you know, Caucasian or from other mm -hmm. ethnic groups. Um, the other thing I learned that it, the ones of um, whether they're Asian descent or not, I'm not sure but over 60% of our listeners are either refugees or immigrants themselves or come from family backgrounds of immigrants and refugees. And I think that's the important part because that for me also validates that our stories aren't limited to Vietnamese people. Mm. It's like, if you ever have had 
you know, experiences in your life or come from a family where you know you have to navigate two cultures, where you know there's complexity behind why your parents came to the United States, you know, and what they had to overcome to get here um, and then to build a new life here. Mm. You can relate to these stories. And so these were things that I think I had inklings of. And so it's nice to have a survey that like backs up. And these are things that this is data that like podcast platforms can't give you. Yeah, like, you have to, sure. you know, get them yourself. Yeah, no, I, I am a kind of like a data guy, like I use data in my fundraising career. So I do look at the stats, but I, it's that one of those things where I just weigh up my time that like I don't have time to go in and look at the Spotify and look at this. And I, I do have a spot. I had a sponsor for the last season because of COVID. They've taken a pause right now. But the biggest question is how many listeners are in Saigon? And for me, it's 50% are in Vietnam. And probably ninety percent of those are in Saigon, some in some mm-hmm. in other places. Um, yeah. But that's about the biggest. How I get how out of interest, like how many listeners are you getting? Are you getting in the like thousands? Are you per yeah. episode? Wow. Per episode. Yeah. Do you do you ever look on Listen Notes? Have you seen this website, ListenNotes.com? Someone told me about it, and I think I've I've looked at it um, a couple of times. I'm similar to you, where like I've. At first, let me just tell you, because I come from a management consulting background, (laughs) it's so hard to stay away from the data. Like I was always like trying to dissect it, trying to make sense of it. And then, like I said, I just come to terms where like, I'll look at some high level numbers, but I'm not really dissecting it anymore. And I think for me, when we release a listener uh, survey, um, you know, those two data points I shared were important, but there's other things that we asked that were more meaningful to us. Like I asked questions like, you know, did listening to our podcast want to make you ask your family stories? Mm. And we had responses that said, yes, I actually sat my parents down. Um, I also asked like, did it make you want to explore other Asian America um, diaspora narratives and published work? And the answer was yes to like an overwhelming majority. So like for me, I wanted to kind of understand what my podcast was motivating them to do next. Um, so, and that for me, again, is just more important than the numbers. Like I want to know that we're like influencing you somehow and making a positive impact. Yeah. But you're going to like this number. Okay. So I, I, <laughs> I came across this website a few months ago. It's called listennotes.com. I guess it aggregates all the data. And this is the stat that, made my day, made my year, and I'm still talk about it. I had no idea 7 million bikes is in the top 10% of podcasts worldwide. Yes. And that is like, I think we are too. And I think- No, no, I've got, I've just looked you up. You're in the top 1.5%. Yeah. Look. All right. Now you have that. made my day. I can't. I see don't know if you can see that because of the blur. Yeah, <laughs> look it up. Listennotes.com. You're in. So because I was struggling to figure out, and I've seen people post this in podcast groups. What is a good number? Because I see some people post, "Oh, we got a thousand downloads. Is that good?" And then I've seen other people be like, "I've been doing this for six months, and I've had like five downloads total, and it's kind of hard." But then I found this stat from Buzzsprout that said if it broke it down by downloads in the first seven days and it was if it was like uh the top one percent which you're in is like a thousand downloads a week so with my podcast i get between about since covid since this lockdown in saigon my numbers have gone down and i think it's because people aren't commuting because for me most even my wife is like my wife listens to every episode and she hasn't heard an episode in ages because she's not commuting right so my numbers have gone down about 20 percent but I normally get, depends on how much the person shares it that I have on the guest, but normally between 100 to 200. It's really consistent. Every episode gets at least about 100 in the first week. And I wasn't sure if that was good. It seemed like kind of shit, like 100. But then I found this chart from Buzzsprout, and that actually puts me on their chart in the top 20% of podcasts worldwide. Mm-hmm. And then I found this Listen Notes one, and I don't know where they're getting the data from because I get... I get about 400 downloads per week, but that's across all episodes, not a new episode. So I guess, mm-hmm. but anyway, I found this that top 10% of podcasts out of 2 million podcasts across the world. And I was like, are you fucking, wait, I was like, Adrian, I'm in the top 10% of podcasts across the world. <laughs> Yay. You are in 1.5%. I've got- I'm going to share that. Yeah. 
Go listen notes.com. Oh, I can't wait to see you share it. Right. So let's let's wrap up this podcast. I love it. I'm really enjoying this and I'm loving chatting to you. Well, I'm gonna cut most of that bit out and make it um only for the, the community members. Yeah, so I'm, I'll-